I think it's about time to start. Let's see, wait a minute. It's 5.41. That's right. I'm right about that. Thank you for coming. 5.40 in the afternoon, uh, end of the day of the conference, the perfect time to talk about complexity theory. Don't you think? I think so. I think so. Well, hopefully I've made this somewhat entertaining. Uh, this is my story. Hopefully it's going to be a fun story. Um, it's about getting fired, which is always fun. Me completely making a fool out of myself, and hopefully you not. It's the point of the talk. Um, I want to point out that complexity theory, what I'm talking about, is complex. Surprise. Uh, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to understand. It's taken me the last year and a half to even have any kind of grasp of it. It's a very deep topic. Uh, if you hear me say anything wrong, uh, please come up later and tell me. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll put on Twitter if I get anything wrong and one of you people point it out. Hopefully you know about complexity theory to a degree. As I said, um, I've been researching it for the last year and a half. I am not an expert, so I'm not up here as Professor Connery explaining complexity theory to you all. This is me researching, and I want to make that perfectly clear. This is just the results of my research. So why did I do uh, any kind of research? Um, well. I, I am a self-taught programmer, and so over the last year and a half, I decided that I wanted to fill the holes in my knowledge. I wanted to be able to have an intelligent conversation with just about anybody here in the room who's smarter than me, no doubt, and I don't know so much. And so I decided to start investigating, and that's what I did over the last year and a half. And I thought, after a while, ooh, this would be kind of fun, I'll blog it. Now, a lot of people, when you tell them that, they think, oh, you're a big egotist, you know, you're going to just write a blog so you get what, get famous? Like, no. The act of writing a blog post is a commitment. You are committed to telling people what you think, so that's going to drive you to research it and know it more. And then someone suggested we should write a book. <laughs> like, charge money for this? Are you kidding me? I don't, well, actually, that's a really good idea. Because that pushes you even harder to do it right. And so that's, I want you to know that I didn't take any of this casually. Uh, but the big, you might be wondering, but what actually started all this? And what started this whole process is, me getting fired in 2009 and not knowing why. And I lost a job. I did. I lost a job because I tried to tackle a problem that I couldn't solve. And I don't know if anyone here has ever been faced with that, where you literally come up against a wall and you have to tell your client or your boss, I couldn't solve it. So that was me in 2009, and it exposed me as a major imposter, if you will. It made me feel really horrible. Because what I ended up coming up face first, in, I just went right into complexity theory. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, and I didn't realize that I was facing a problem that was a classic problem, and I shouldn't have been trying to solve it. So over this last year and a half, as I mentioned, I have come right up against P and NP and all those fun topics. And I want to mention, I've got to give a shout out to my slide designers. Uh, I am a horrible artist. I tried my best. Uh, some of the slides are by me, but most of them are by my kids. I actually pay them money to do my slides, and they think that's quite exciting. So, Also, you're going to see some other pictures um, in these slides, and they're all public domain. I want to just point that out. Public domain or free to use. So let's start the story, shall we? Once upon a time, this is me as a developer. At least this is how I look at myself <laughs> back then. That is actually me, by the way. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but that's kind of fun. When you first start out and you don't know what you're doing, it's a constant process of discovery and excitement. Woohoo! let's do this. Um, so this is about the time of the second dot, or the first dot-com bubble, and my main field was database work, and I didn't know anything about analytics, but I got hired by an analytics company, so I started working for them. And my boss came up to me one day, and he gave me a very special project. And he said, I want to see a query uh, just like Amazon's bought together. So if you think about an e-commerce system, you have products, and they look at a product page, and then they want to see related products that other people have bought, or you would see that if you go to Amazon. So if you're buying a coffee maker, then you'll see filters. They, people also bought filters, right? That's a pretty powerful query. So I was like, sure, why not? That was always my answer to everything. I can figure it out. I've got books, I've got the internet, I've got Google, and I also have failure. And that's exactly what happened. I could not do this query. And it perplexed me, but I thought, it's got to be a way, right? Now, if you think about this, how would you do this? You, maybe some of you have written this before, but you have products and you have a, a table of, let's say, 100,000 orders, and you have to find the products that were bought the most with product X. So what kind of query would you write? That's query one. Query two is, I need you to mine the database and buy the products that were bought the most together. How complex is that? Do you know? 
Do you have a word for it? <laughs> Do you know if it's a classic problem that you should never try? Uh, also, would you even try? That's the next question. So at the time, I worked with my handsome friend, Kaveh, uh, and we worked at the analytics company together, and I promised him I'd put his face on the slide. Just kidding. Um, he was a Harvard MBA, is a Harvard, Harvard MBA, uh, UC Berkeley graduate, very smart man, one of the smartest men I know, knows his statistics cold. And so I sat down with him one day and I said, you know, Kav, I have a really tough query I need to write, and here's the deal. It's just like Amazon. And he's, without skipping a beat, he says, oh yeah, that's a co-occurrence query. And I'm like, yes, it's got a name. And this is important. When things have names, they solidify themselves conceptually in your head. You can tie a word to a thing, and there's a lot of people that believe that you don't know that concept until you have a word for it, that the two are actually tied together in your brain. That's a whole other topic. For me, I'm just jumping up and down. Yeah, it's a thing, and let's do it. So he knows SQL, Kave knows SQL really well, and he also knows uh, spreadsheets. I know SQL, I know spreadsheets. There is the structure of your query. So I have uh, orders and order items joined together to orders and <laughs> order items with the order ID. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do this, but if you're doing it in pure SQL, this is the thing you want to do. What I'm not showing you is the inequality join that also has to go in there. It is a circular nightmare query. It's pretty fun. We got it to work, which is neat. Uh, unfortunately, when you ran it over the whole sample set, it crashed the server, and it, I think it ran for 48 hours before it died. And it's just not a query that you're supposed to run in the database, which is fine, because thinking one night, I said, I can use an intermediate table. That's what I called it. Uh, so I just denormalized the table, and I called it sales relationships. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just build this using some code. So from ID is a target product, to ID is the other product, and then I just go and check the database and uh, inter uh, uh, increment the sales count. So if I'm writing this in code, which I did in the hotel room the other day because I was bored, I don't know, I just decided to do it because I wanted to show you what it would look like in code. And this is what I ended up doing. I didn't use SQL, I used code. I know this is a little bit small, I'm gonna zoom in on it in a second, but this is the whole routine to generate that to that sales table. So over 100,000 records, I can build that table with this. Let's break it down. So I'm using the Chinook sample database. I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing. It's just albums and records and sales. So it can be any sample data set. We were actually doing something completely different. It had nothing to do with e-commerce, but we still had these products we, or these records we needed to relate. So we can just go with this sample data. Um, the first thing that you do is you pull out all the products or the albums in the database, and then you're going to start looping over it. And then you're going to run a secondary query for each product. And that secondary query is going to go look at the database and pull out all the orders where that original product was involved. <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. And then what you're going to do at that point is you're going to look and see if a relationship exists. Yes, increment a counter. No, don't. This is not a terribly exciting routine until you see this. That is called success. And I... <laughs> When I, when I got this to run, it took about two hours at the time, and this is, again, 2009 time frame. I got it to work. And so this is randomized data. I, I randomized some data just to show you so that these relationships might not make sense, but on a real data set, they do. So, for instance, coincidentally, uh, we have Guns N' Roses at the top sold with Metallica and a sales count of 20. What does that tell you? What does that tell your boss about your sales? It says, one, you got a lot of metalheads, right? In the, and and they, love, they love the old stuff. That's, that is intelligence. That's actionable intelligence. And man, oh man, was my boss happy about this. I delivered. And not only that, you can query this table real time. And so I would just run that routine every night, query this table real time. We had a win. It was radical. And I felt quite happy because I didn't know what I was doing. Right? I literally did not know what I was doing. And that can be good and it can be dangerous because here's my thing. My thing is that failure is the best possible teacher. I love failure and I, I try and be really open about failing as much as I can because, man, you learn. The harder, the harder you fail, the better you learn. The opposite of that is true as well. Success can be the worst teacher. If you just are accidentally successful doing something like I just did, it makes you think that you understand it. And that is a disaster because it kind of inflates your ego a little bit. You start to think like, whoa, I know analytics. And that's just not the case. I felt really, really excited, but <laughs> I was not, uh, that's me, by the way. That's, that's kind of how I felt, really, kind of 17-year-old conceited punk. Um, you get really, now, 
I, I know I'm looking out this card. You guys must have done something like this and been successful at it and thought, yeah, I, I got this wired. I can do F sharp. Sorry, I, I have to do an F sharp call at every single talk I do. But the reality is something different. This is me crushing a puppy thinking I know everything about dogs. I loved this dog and I could tell you anything about puppies and dogs when I was a kid. But this is the reality of where I was at. Now, you might be thinking, well, you solved the problem. Isn't that, isn't that kind of what we're here for? You solve the problem. What's the problem? Let's talk about the problem. See if we can play a game called Spot the Problem. And I've kind of highlighted it for you. <laughs> Just don't want to make it too, you know, complex. Um, so, yeah, here's the deal. I've got a nested for loop that's running queries. Now, that's, I'm, I'm running this on, the, on a side server. This is the only routine running. So this worked fine for us. A small size uh, execution, so it was no big deal. I didn't have to worry about crushing the server. Now, let me ask you this. What if my boss came to me and said, well, can we relate three products instead of two? Does anybody know how much more complex that problem is? If you had to guess, all right? It would be called factorial complexity. And that is something that will <laughs> result in bad things. So in order to have three related products, I have to run one, two, three nested for loops, which means disaster. Four related products, five related products, six. You keep going, keep nesting those for loops. That's pretty complex, don't you think? That's a pretty complex routine. Keep this in the back of your mind. Factorial complexity is something that uh, you should be able to recognize. OK, let's fast forward to 2009. That's me again. This is Web 2.0 timeframe. Uh, Rails is kind of the hotness. Uh, lots of sites built with pastel colors and big fonts. So I am now just kind of getting back into web development. I've moved away from database work. Um, and I am a one-man wrecking crew is the way I kind of <laughs> refer to myself. So anyway, I'm building sites, and I'm, I'm, I'm having a good time. And one day I get, a, I get a call from a friend who says, hey, can you build us a Rails site? And I say, yeah. Uh, I like Rails. I've used it on my own. I'm starting to build a business with it. And, um, but yeah, I'd love to have a contract as long as you know that I'm new at this. And they said, well, that's actually not why we hired. We want to hire you. We heard you're good with analytics. <laughs> and I said, oh, as a matter of fact, well, no, the truth is I told them the truth. Like, I've done it before. I worked in an analytics, analytics company. I did some cool queries. And uh, I built the database and all that and so on. And then I, can, I can probably do it. What's your problem? And, uh, and they said, well, we're building this website. And it's basically, I'm going to call this problem the bored millennial problem. It's for college freshmen, or first years, I guess, is what you call them over here. But freshmen over there, they're brand new to a university. And they show up, and they don't have any friends. They don't know where to go or what to do. And so this startup decided, hey, well, let's get these people together. We're going to help them find each other. We're going to match them up. And not only that, we're going to match these groups of people to events and places that they want to go to. Sounds like fun. Matching. Hooray. And at the time, I actually said, wait a minute. You know, I am building a Ruby on Rails site, and you just hired me to do that. Um, we're not talking about anything else, right? And they said, well, actually, you're building the algorithm. <laughs> I, I kind of pushed back, and they said, I don't know how to do it. But then I thought, wait a minute. I've done something like this before. I can do it. I can make this happen. Stupid decision. So here's the way this breaks down. I am given a profile of some students. When you sign up, you have to check some boxes and tell me about yourself and so on. And then I have to match you up with other people. So not only do I have to match you up, I also have to have some kind of scoring on that match. So for instance, you might casually not get along with somebody. You might really get along with somebody. You might hate them. You might not care. So there's that waiting. And I looked at that and I'm like, hey, I remember a term reading about this on VentureBeat or TechCrunch or whatever the heck it was at the time. That's the social graph. Facebook did it, right? And they're using PHP, and I'm using Rails. So I should be able to do this, because somehow Rails can do it over PHP. All right, a little bit arrogant, a little bit arrogant, but come on, stay with me now. You guys have felt this before. You've got a rad platform that you're using. You've got a cool database, Azure, all this other whatnot. You, could be able to, you should be able to solve any problem. So does anybody know the name of the problem that I was trying to solve, just by my description. Is anybody familiar with classic problems? OK. It's called clique. Click, clique. I'm not sure how to say this. It's basically using a social graph, or developing a social graph, applying some kind of logic to it, and creating subsets of graphs within a greater graph. Does anybody know the other definition of clique? <laughs> it's called NP-hard. 
And NP-hard is the classification uh, in complexity terms of what this means. Does anybody know what NP-hard means? Does anyone? NP-hard means that you get fired if you try and <laughs> implement NP-hard. This is fun. I was expecting someone to yell it out. Yeah, NP-hard's rad, man. Um, really, I really want this to soak in. I kind of, I, it's tongue in cheek. I did, I lost my job because I could not identify clique. And, and it's weird. I would think now, well, why should have? But back then, I, you know, I didn't care about that problem. Who cares about that problem? I thought I could solve it. That's the thing. And I want that to soak in. It's not like I didn't know it in terms of like how to implement it. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't recognize it. And that's, my, that's, my, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Because my client blamed me, of course, because I had to say to them, I don't know how to solve your problem. And they said, why? And I had no words for it. I just said, it's too hard. And they said, you're an idiot. I thought you were good. Fired me, went through a series of other developers, went out of business. If I had words to explain what the problem was and why it was so hard, I might have saved a lot of people a lot of time and a lot of money. That's the truth. Okay, so let's fast forward a few years, and every, every year or so, I get together with some college friends. Kave happens to be one of my college friends, and uh, I did not go to Harvard. No, I did not go to Berkeley. I just happened to know him. <laughs> I sat in the corner where he used to walk by. I'm like, hey, can I have some money? Uh, not really. Well, maybe okay a little bit. So anyway, every summer we go, um, we go on this little like guy trip, and we go and we'll go fishing and hang out and do stuff. And so I sat with him, and this is I think three or four years ago. And I said, "Hey, you know what? I had this weird problem once, and I had to do." And I described it to him: social graphs, subsets of social things, and everything. And his reaction was pretty pretty appropriate. <laughs> and that's kind of funny. Though. Doesn't that look like him? See, I was like, "See, see, I don't know." I'm resisting the bald joke, John. You know I am. Yeah. Uh, okay, anyway, so he says to me, have you ever heard of complexity theory? I'm like, yeah, no. No, I have not. <laughs> no, I have not heard about this. So he starts to explain it to me, and it turns out there's this thing called complexity theory. And, and he's going through all these classifications and tags and numbers and blah, 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 blah. My eyes start to cross. This is tough stuff, right? But he starts to explain it to me in a way that is sort of helpful. And he says, basically, think of it this way. There's all these buckets and terms, but the bottom three here, P, X, and R, are the thing, is the thing you should kind of get to know. Basically means easy, hard, impossible. I'm like, that's math? Okay. And he's like, hey, okay, let's step into it. So he starts to explain this to me. He goes, imagine you're trying to do something simple. You're trying to sort a list using quick sort. Like, I don't know what quicksort is, but okay. Well, it turns out quicksort's an algorithm to sort a list. So here we have an array. You put a partition in there, and you sort a list in place. It's, it's an interesting algorithm. And he said, if you, if you had 10 items like this, and then you bumped it to 100, how much harder would that be to do? Not hard at all. How much longer would that take? And I'd say, I don't know, another millisecond? Okay, how about a million? Oh, it may take another 10 milliseconds. Well, how about 10 million? Well, I don't know, 100 milliseconds? And he's right. So 1x, 10x, 100x, think about that. I'm like, okay, all right, I got this, I got this. And he goes, you have a graph, right? You tried to build a graph, now you have a graph, and you want to run some calculations over that graph to find the shortest distance from one node, S, to all the other ones, A, B, C, D, and E. And I said, okay. And he goes, there's an algorithm called Dijkstra's shortest path. And I said, whatever, okay. So what? And he goes, well, you can actually run that over a graph and calculate the shortest distance in a reasonable amount of time. It would take you maybe a half a millisecond to calculate that because it just cycles over the graph and it works. And he said if you add 100 nodes, it will still work maybe an extra millisecond. If you add a million nodes, then it starts to slow down a little bit, but it's maybe 100 times, 10,000 times, and there's that thing again, 10x, 100x, 5x, whatever. We have an equation now to think about the complexity of what we're doing. Because that's the way, if you, ever know, if you know anything about big O notation, it talks about complexity in terms of math. So when we talk about complexity in terms of math, it could be as simple as saying, well, that's about 10 times as hard. Or that's a squaring operation. I'm smart. Basically, what that means is you have polynomial complexity. It's a polynomial equation. What's a polynomial equation? This is where you get to remember maths. Uh, it's that right there. Anything that has 2x or 2 times plus 3 times, whatever, or something squared, something cubed, whatever. This is a polynomial equation. If you can describe the complexity of something using terms like 5 times, 10 times, whatever, polynomial. 
What does that mean? Well, P just happens to be the term, or the, start, the letter that starts the word polynomial, so we call it <laughs> P time. That's what mathematicians would say if we're talking about complexity. And this is the way mathematicians think about complexity in terms of complexity versus time, or how much time given the inputs and the change. And so it's say, oh, well, that's P time. That's a P time thing you're trying to do. So let's think about chess. Chess is something different. So Kaveh's explaining to me, I'm a horrible chess player, by the way. He says, well, if you and I are playing chess, and I asked you to write an app that you could snap a picture of that chessboard and have that app tell you how to win the game, how hard do you think that would be? <laughs> So here's the fun thing, is that there are more electrons in the universe than, I'm sorry, there's more moves in chess than there are electrons in the universe. Uh, a lot of chess fans think it's actually infinite, it's not, it's finite based on math, it doesn't matter, but it might as well be infinite because there are a ton of moves. Now, if we're trying to figure out how to optimize a chess game, yeah, that's really hard to do. Now, think about the complexity of this. You and I are playing a chess game and I say, Shazam, and I make that chessboard go to 10 by 10 instead of 8 by 8, how much harder did that chess game become? It became exponentially harder. So when you think about complexity in this way, it's not sorting an array, you're actually getting into something that is mind-blowingly difficult. In fact, some of these problems, when, when they start to scale, the time frames on this include the sun blowing up a few times, and so <laughs> as opposed to like where you and I are concerned in P-time stuff, which is, you know, I don't know, gosh, it took five milliseconds to sort that array. I'm really bummed. Uh, this would be like the sun blowing up ten times over. So this is, this is really important. So anyways, Kavi's explaining this to me. I'm like, I get it, exponentially hard. Okay, I think I'm understanding this. And he goes, well, the problem that you are trying to solve there is in the same class. It's not as hard as chess, but it's in the same complexity class. It's called exp exp or just exponential time. I'm like, oh, okay, that really makes sense. And he goes, it's also NP-hard. And I said, there's that word again. Uh, what the hell is NP-hard? <laughs> and he starts to explain it to me. And my eyes just cross. I'm like, oh, God, can just somebody make this simple? And so he tried to, but we're up sipping scotch in the hills, and I'm like, I give up. So I'm happy that I now have a word and a problem that I can tie my failure to, which I think is important. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a way of solving it, and I don't quite know what it even means. So over this last year and a half, that's what I dedicated my life to, is to trying to figure this out. Well, I shouldn't say dedicated my life, maybe my career. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to see if I can explain this to you. And if I don't, feel free to throw things at John Galloway over there, and then he'll talk to me about this. Thank you. Okay, so uh, when the talk is done, you guys want to go do something? I think we should. Okay. What should we do? <laughs> so how do we solve this problem? So what would likely happen in a group, I know all of you have faced this, where you're sitting in a group and someone says, does anybody want to go do something? And everyone looks at each other. Duh, duh. So it turns out that this problem is fairly complex to solve. Right? How do we find a place that we all want to go to? The best place. And that's going to be the key thing. Where, if we had some choices or whatever, what is the best place that we can go to? There's a number of ways to solve this. Let's step through this. How do we solve this problem? Number one, uh, Scott Hanselman could be sitting here in the front row, and he's not, thank God, but he's sitting here in the front row, and uh, he could just stand up and say, we're going to go to Chipotle, because Chipotle has the best everything, and uh, I want a Diet Coke. So, and he'd turn around to you guys and say, let's go to Chipotle. And I would say, eh, eh. then it turns out Kathleen Dollard is sitting over there on the other side. She's not either. But she might say, you know what, I'm fancying pizza. I want to go have some pizza. Uh, let's go to Neil's yard, and we can get some cheese while we're up there. Wouldn't that be fun? And so we take a few more, uh, few more ideas from people, and then we do a vote, and we go with the, with the biggest, uh, we go with the biggest, um, the biggest vote getter, I guess you could say. How complex is that? Anybody want to have a guess? Not complex. So if you know big O notation, this is order n. Order n just means we had two choices, we had to pick one. It's as hard as many choices that we have. Uh, if, if you're familiar with Google and PageRank, this is how PageRank actually works. This is how PageRank solves complex problems. What PageRank does is it uses the authority model. So they suck in every single page off the internet, and they look at the incoming and outgoing links of each page, and then they, they basically increment a counter. So let's say that middle site or the red ball right there might be Hanselman's site and that 
little site you see down there that you can't see would be mine, right? So if, if you're searching and a keyword comes up and, it's, and it hits Hanselman's site, it's ranked above me because he's got more bound links. He's got more authority. He stands up in this room and says, we're going to Chipotle, and everybody goes, oh my God, it's Hanselman. Basically, we're going to do what he says. That is a P time solution because we're just searching over authority, and that's easy. Did I solve my problem of finding the optimal place to go? No, no, I did not. That is not an optimal solution, but it's close. That is key. And so we need to think about this. We didn't quite get the optimal. We can't prove it's optimal. We got really close. How can we get optimal? Let's talk about this. So Kathleen realizes, like, we're going to go to Chipotle and I do something. And so she says, uh, how about we all just dis- decide as a group what we're going to do, where we're going to go? And so we, start, we, break into, we break into a conversation, and we kind of sit there, and I talk to you, you talk to me, we talk to each other, and we're coming up with ideas, and we're breaking into little subgroups, and I really like someone's idea. So that bond is a little bit stronger. Like, yes, I like that one. And then someone else says, we should go somewhere over here. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. And so the conversation starts to grow and take on a life of its own, and our group momentum is slowing things down. And then... It, before we know it, it's going to turn into a ridiculous mess. Come on. <laughs> See a well-rehearsed slide right here, by the way. What we're trying to do, and this is important, this is what that would look like, I think. We are trying to, and this is important, we're trying to optimize the combination of us. We're not trying to optimize individuals. We're trying to optimize our group as a combination. Where does everybody, we're all connected in this. And so, okay, we understand each other and we're trying to optimize all that. It turns out this problem has a name, which is if you switch those around, it's called a combinatorial optimization. You're just trying to maximize groups of things that have a relationship. This is exponentially hard. Ta-da! So that's, I mean, that's, we know that now. We know that we're trying to optimize complex things. That gives us a new word that we now understand. So when the group looks at each other and goes, I don't know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Bink, combinatorial optimization. Words are important. Okay. It sounds kind of scary. Exponential time stuff is really complex, but that's where the fun is. And this is where we start getting into the headbanging kind of thing. We now know we have simple problems. We have hard problems. We have impossible problems. Exponential problems kind of go back and forth between right after simple and then right before impossible. And here's a modified graph. (laughs) There's, in the red up there, is a new term I'm going to throw at you called NP. I'm going to define what NP means in just a second, but I do want you to keep in mind that the fun, what we get paid for every day, what you and I work on every day, are problems that are in NP. And you don't know that yet. Maybe, maybe some of you do. But hopefully you will by the time we're done. Working in P-time problems sucks. I mean, that would be like me saying, so can you make me a sorting algorithm, please? What? Here's the framework. So NP is where the fun is, as I mentioned. Uh, These problems are a little bit hard to put your finger on, and I'm going to warn you that you're going to want to throw things at me right now. Just go with me. In order to understand NP, we have to believe in this thing called Rob's Lucky Algorithm. And Rob's lucky algorithm is something a little bit different than a normal algorithm. Here's the way it works. We have a set of decisions right here. We're going to start with a square. We're going to go through and just we have to decide on whatever it is. Just pretend this is a decision graph. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no success. Yes, no, yes, no fail. With my lucky algorithm, I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. The first time, every time, and I will be right. So let that sink in. I know that sounds crazy. As developers, we don't want to think this way. As developers, when we, are working with these, uh, when we are working with these systems, we want decisions like loops. We want to build a decision out of another decision. We want to know what came before and what came after. In other words, when we put data into a system like this, we have to be able to reproduce it. There's a name for this, and it's called deterministic, as you might or might not know. This is deterministic system. Where did it come from? I don't know. Let's determine it by looking at the code. There's always a way to figure out how you got there and from where it came. A non-deterministic system is a system that is just essentially magic. I will just tell you how does this work or how this works. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, so, okay, sounds a little bit magical. But if you ask Luke how he blew up the Death Star, 
um, which I'm sure all of you have at some point, uh, he wouldn't be able to tell you other than I just relied on the force. It's kind of the same thing. He wouldn't be able to tell you how he did it. He wouldn't be able to tell you what mechanism fired his hands and fired the gun and boom, bang. He wouldn't tell you how that little circle thing. Sound magical? Does it sound magical? Now, let me ask you a question. Does this have any effect on you? I'm looking at this picture, my little friend, do you want to come up here and pet my little friend? <laughs> Why would this have an effect on you? I mean, did your parents tell you and say, this is a hornet, don't touch it? Did you ever get stung by one? I know a lot of people who have, but they tried to run away first and they screamed their head off. If I showed you a picture of a spider, maybe a height, you would have a reaction to this. Can I ask you how you have that reaction? No. I mean, you might be able to tell me, oh, of course, evolutionary selection and it's race, memory, and instinct, and I was born to da 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 da, this is how we survive. Okay, sure, that's fine, that's a great theory. Not provable, non deterministic. That's my point. Non determinism exists, believe it or not. And it, it's kind of confounding to think about because it sounds magical, like, wait a minute. But there are actually computer, uh, computer languages that you can use to program non deterministically. Prolog is one of them. And uh, this looks kind of crunchy, but basically what this is right here is a function, two functions, with the exact same signature. And they basically handle two different conditions. It's not pattern matching. Basically, the deal is that these functions get called at runtime, determined by the machine, not you as the programmer. That's a key thing to understand. And it even has a failover backtracking. So if it tries one function call and it doesn't work, it can go back and try the other one. Why am I bringing this up? Because if we can solve problems using the force, then really complex things become easy, right? Really hard problems, exponentially complex problems like super crazy to group decisions become easy. So that has a special term to mathematicians because they're very interested in this. That's called non-deterministic polynomial time. So remember polynomial time, P, just means easy. Uh, it, we have a set of problems that become easy if we can use magic. <laughs> Quote me on that. Okay, so let's think about this. So if we, if we could use my lucky algorithm to decide where we're going to go after this, all Kathleen has to do is to go through a list and say, all right, I'm going to use Rob's algorithm. Should we go to Chipotle? No. Piccadilly Circus? No. Should we go to the hotel pub? Ding! It's the right answer. Let's go. We just solved that problem, which is interesting. We're playing a game of Catan later on. And if you think about Catan, as a mathematician might, Catan is a set of decisions that you're trying to optimize to win the game. So at any point in Catan, you could use my lucky algorithm and say, should I do this, should I do this, should I do this, da, 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 da. You can go through the list, you can iterate over the list, then ding, the right answer will show up, boom, you win Catan, I win Catan. You and your group are kicking off a brand new project, you've got a lot of decisions to make. I'm using that word decisions over and over. You've got a lot of decisions to make as a group. What technology, what dates, for, the, for uh, what team members are going to tackle what. So you're going to sit around and we're going to talk about it. You might as well be talking about where we're going to go later to have a beer at the pub or whatever you want to drink. If we had my lucky algorithm, I could just stand in the middle of the room. We could cut this meeting short and get out of there in just a few minutes because I could just tell you <laughs> what you're going to do. So I know that sounds crazy. Just stay with me. There's an explanation to all this. That's what NP is. Exponentially complex problems solved easily with a lucky guess. I know I'm simplifying that term. We're going to get into some more detail right now. Let's break it down because there's more to NP. In fact, there's two subclasses. There's a, there's a lot more to it, but there's two subclasses that you really need to know. The first one is decision problems. And you keep hearing me say decisions because that's really at the core of NP, this notion of decision problems. And what a decision problem simply is, is any kind of any kind of thing that you want answered with a yes or no question or true false answer. So we can loop over all kinds of complex stuff and then based on the answers in that loop, we can decide on some really complex stuff. You can think about it in programming terms as what values for X and Y will turn true. Now as programmers using a deterministic system, you would have to plug in all values for X and Y to see what the answer is to this. That's deterministic. Non-deterministic, you just know. X and Y need to be true or false. The second kind of problems that we have, you keep hearing me saying optimization. Now, optimization doesn't mean maximum, doesn't mean most, it could also mean least, whatever. You're trying to find an end. You're trying to find, okay, this is the stuff I'm interested in. My bored millennial problem is an optimization problem. We know it's a combinatorial optimization problem. So 
we now have two types of problems that we kind of keep talking about over and over again. So in NP, we have two buckets that we want to think about these things. And I'm sure you've heard the term NP complete. So a problem that's a decision problem, a problem that has a yes or no answer that you know is complex, uh, is NP complete. A problem that's an optimization problem, well, there's other ones too, that's why the asterisk is down there, tend to be NP hard or are NP hard. I can, make that, I can go ahead and claim that statement. Here's now the full definition of NP-complete, just so you don't think I'm waving my arms and making up things. NP-complete problems are, I can't believe I'm using bullet points, exponential time problems, so we know it's exponentially complex, exponential time. P-time problems, in other words, easy, if we're using a lucky guess. Uh, and then also, the most important is it's verifiable in P-time. What does that mean? It means you know that that is, that is the correct answer. So if I'm looking at a big old set of, uh, if I'm looking at a big old set of decisions and I apply the lucky algorithm and I get true back, that is a, validate, a validated answer. That is verified. That is proven. NP hard problems, on the other hand, are not verifiable in P time. Why is that? Because as a group, even if we're sitting in here trying to do the combinatorial optimization of what's going to be the best possible pub, Kathleen stands up and says, let's go. Okay, we can go, but how do we know that that's the right answer. The only way to know is to do each one of the things. Go through every single iteration, every possible decision to verify your position on these things and then go and actually do it. So that's, that just puts the complexity right back into exponential time. So this is the thing about NP hard problems. They're at least as hard as any other problem in NP. Okay, so we know that. In other words, it can't be a simple problem like sorting and you can't expect that to be NP hard. You can't just make that claim. It actually has to be in NP. This is another tricky one. This is where people usually blur their eyes. Any other problem in NP can be reduced to it. We'll talk about that in just a second. Just, you know, you can reduce a problem by just shaping it, rewording it, moving some things around. You can, you, can, uh, you can reduce one problem to another in NP and claim that it's NP hard. The final thing, and this is what trips up a lot of people, it doesn't actually have to be in NP in terms of classification. Because NP hard is kind of a tag. It doesn't mean that this is the classification for a problem. In fact, there is a problem that is literally impossible to solve. It's the halting problem. If you've ever heard about it, it's uh, Alan Turing's claim that you can't write a program that will determine if another program will stop or halt. It's an impossible pro pro uh, problem to solve because it involves an infinite recursive loop. It's NP hard. Why is it NP hard? Because of reduction. And this is the key. And this is the key, the key, the key, the key, the key to this whole big fat mess. A problem is NP hard if ever the problem in NP can be reduced to it. I can take the halting problem just by saying, will a program halt? That's a yes or no question. I get back yes or no, I claim it's NP hard because I can reduce that to a decision problem. If I can reduce it to a decision problem, this is important, if I can reduce it to a decision problem, it's NP hard and I can make that claim. If it is a decision problem, it's NP complete. You might be thinking, well, okay, so what? I'm, I'm going to build this a little, bit, a little bit more here. Let's go back to that if statement. This is actually a classic NP complete problem. This is the first NP complete problem. That's, in fact, this problem was defined by Levin and Cook back in the 70s, kind of started out the whole complexity theory thing. A big, long conditional statement like this has a funky name. It's called the Boolean satisfiability problem. In other words, if I have a big, long conditional statement, what values for x and y will return true? If I can have a decision problem I can reduce to what's called sat, I know it's NP-complete. I can take that a step further and say if I have an optimization problem that I can then ask in the form of a yes-no question, that's a reduction, then I can say, well, that must be NP-hard. The reduced problem is now NP-complete. So what? <laughs> I know that's what you're thinking. You're like, okay, goody. We're doing all this word dance. We're doing this algorithm dance. Why do we care about this? Well, number one, the obvious thing is my lucky algorithm doesn't exist. Right? I mean, if it did, wouldn't that be fun? Because then a whole bunch of complex stuff gets solved. Uh, we can cure cancer. There's a protein folding. There's a bunch of heavy-duty scientific problems that can be solved if we did have this. In fact, it is one of the most pressing problems of science today. Is there a lucky non-deterministic algorithm? Because if there is, then every problem that's in NP that we've labeled becomes P. They all become the same. P would equal NP. And I'm sure you've read about this, heard about this. 
with these crazy blog posts, and uh, I've, I've read them too, and I've never understood what that meant. Now I do. So if we had a non-deterministic algorithm and you found it in this room, you get a million dollars because the Cray Institute, the Millennial Institute, has this millennial problem, millennium problem. They have a millennial problem too, no doubt. But they have a millennium problem where you'll get a million dollars if you can come up with this, which is pretty neat. A lot of people are looking into this. They don't think it's magic. They think it's real. If you sit in, uh, in a symposium someday and you bring this problem up, you'll get a lot of people pounding the tables because a lot of people don't believe it's real. It's interesting. It's one of those things. Does it exist and we just haven't found it yet? And a lot of people would say, that's a really dumb question to ask. If we haven't found it, then I don't know if it exists. And I would say, look out the window at the airplanes landing across the way. 200 years ago, no way, man. Today, it's just everyday things, how I got here in 10 hours, which is kind of ridiculous to think about. 200 years ago, absolute miracle. So we kind of have to keep our egos in check in terms of science. So... We, have a non we don't have a non-deterministic algorithm, which means that bad things can happen if you try and solve NP-hard problems. So this is where we get to turn the corner a little bit, because not in every single case, not always. I know it can't, you can't just be hard-nosed about it and say, if you try and solve an NP-hard problem, you're going to get fired. That's not necessarily true. It depends what you're trying to do. I got lucky. In my very first query, my co-occurrence query, I got lucky because... I only had to optimize two things. So the graph was made of basically two things. I didn't have to do very much. It was still a factorial problem. Even this might be doable. Even this. I can sort of dabble in NP if I want to. As long as you keep it small, there's no, there's no problem to like shutting down your server. It's actually kind of doable. This is the work that we do every day in computer science. We come up against these problems that are in NP. Even the clique problem, we have an approximation with Google's uh, page rank. And we can, uh, I'm sorry, we have, an we have some approximation algorithms that we can use for clique that actually make little subsets in a larger graph. It works, it's not perfect. <laughs> you might be wondering why you're looking at a picture of a rabbit. Understanding the problems that you are asked to create, or I'm sorry, yes, <laughs> those two. <laughs> Understanding the problems that you're asked to solve are critical. And it turns out there's a whole list of these problems that you might have heard of, but they're all sort of related. And I want to step through these right now to show you what I mean. Your daughter says, Dad, I want a rabbit. And you say, all right, as long as you clean up your room. And she says, no problem, can you help me? I say, sure. And I go grab some bins out of the garage. And my wife pokes her head in and says, okay, I need as much space in the garage as possible, so you need to make sure you optimize the packing of those bins. I only want the smallest amount of possible bins you can, you can pack. Can you guess the name of that problem? <laughs> it's called bin packing, and it's a classic math problem that people have been researching and trying to figure out an algorithm. What's the easiest way that you can take these items that are related by uh, size and squeeze them into the smallest possible volume? There's another related problem to bin packing. It's called knapsack which is a fascinating one. Again, you have all these items that you want to pack into a single knapsack. You want to maximize, the, maximize value, minimize weight. Can you guess the complexity of this problem? You should, because I just used some keywords. Optimization of a relationship. Combinatorial optimization, it's NP hard. Of course, you've all heard of this one, I hope. Uh, you have cities to visit. Your boss wants you to go clienting, which is a word I just learned. Um, and you want to go visit some people. He says you make sure it's the cheapest possible path that you can take. So we have these cities that are related by this notion of cost. Once again, we have decisions to make based on related items, and we need to optimize that relationship in order to have the lowest cost. Traveling salesman problem, which is classic. By the way, hopefully when we're done, you're going to understand. Do you, see, do you guys are starting to understand these slides? It's kind of cool. Uh, so that's traveling salesman, absolute classic. You're sitting at work, and you're trying to do these things. In your head, you can say, God, I've been asked to optimize something. I'm kind of working on something that I can show as a graph. It's related. I have to make some decisions. You're starting to deal with complexity theory. You're starting to speak in complexity theory, which is something that is critical, to me at least. Looking back on my career, I wish I would have had those words. I wish I would have had those labels because I would have avoided a mess. Okay. It's not about avoiding a mess. It's also about embracing the mess and making sense of it. Because as computer programmers, we try and help people by delivering value to help them make decisions, to help them do things. 
In fact, if you squint your eyes really hard, a computer program is basically one giant decision tree. It's a huge, huge conditional. That's what it is. Your computer program is NP complete. You're working on an NP hard problem. That's just what you're doing. It depends how you go about doing it. What does that mean? Turns out that we don't need to solve these things perfectly. We don't need to solve them completely, right? We don't need to make sure and prove that we've done it. We can have these things that are close enough. And these are called heuristics. And they're also called approximations. A heuristic is a rule of thumb. It's generally what you do. Approximation algorithms are things that have guaranteed results. You're not going to have the perfect result, but it's going to get you within 10%. 5% or whatever. So for instance, traveling salesman, you can use what's called nearest neighbor. Uh, it's called a greedy algorithm because what you do is you traverse the graph and you do what's optimal at that moment in time. So let's say I'm in London and I need to fly to Munich. Uh, and I also need to fly over to Frankfurt and then I need to fly into Oslo and a few other cities. So following nearest neighbor, what I would do is I'd say, what's the next cheapest city? And I'd go there. And once I get over there, what's the next cheapest city? And I go there. Greedy because it's right in front of me. I do what it says to do. Uh, you can, using that, on average, get within 25% of best cost. You, I don't know if you knew that. Now you do. That is a way to solve that problem for your boss, as long as your boss or client knows this. All these other algorithms and, and heuristics apply to all the problems that I was just talking about. There are ways to deal with these things. They're not going to be perfect, but they're going to be close enough. Page rank is not perfect. It's close enough. If I sit here and Google best pub in Docklands, is that where we are? I can tell it says to do this. It's the Yelp thing, right? And we'll just go there. We'll probably have a good time. There are genetic algorithms that you can use to just go over again and again and again and again a decision, a decision set and just work it. Just keep going over it and rely on a pattern to eventually appear. Kind of like ruts in a road with a... With a uh, have you ever seen those wagon wheel ruts in the old western towns? No, maybe not. I don't know. Genetic algorithms work that way. They use the idea of evolution. So you run over this, this uh, problem set repeatedly, and using Bernoulli's weak law of large numbers, which means a pattern will eventually resolve, like flipping a coin, the distribution will come down to 50-50 the more times you do it. Same kind of deal with genetic algorithms. And you can actually solve some really complex stuff, like not getting stung by a bee. As I mentioned, we work with NP every day. We cling to the side of it. We kind of dabble in it a little bit. You don't go too deeply. If you did and you tried to solve it perfectly, you'd end up like me, getting fired. Uh, or if you could work with an approximation and you know the approximation exists or a reasonable heuristic, well, maybe you can save your job. Or maybe you can be the person to come up with a non-deterministic algorithm and get rich. Well, I think it's about time to use Kathleen's good advice. I think that's it for me. And this is, <laughs> you think it's uh, difficult to understand this stuff, try writing about it. Speaking of, um, that's the book I wrote. If you're interested and you want to go take a look at it, it's up at bigmachine.io. If you have any questions, please come up, and that's it for me. Thank you.